The Quad. Over the centuries, from palaces to universities, a quadrangle is often the first decision made by architects when designing what they believe will be a lasting campus. A quad creates opportunity for community within the safe confines of a campus. It creates space for open conversation. It creates spiritual energy between buildings. This quad seems as if it's always been here. Union Presbyterian Seminary is made up of a series of structures that project both enduring strength and comforting welcome. It is the centerpiece of North Richmond. Well into its second century of existence, the seminary's striking red brick buildings, designed in late Gothic Revival style, reveals the influence of England's Hampton Court Palace, home to Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. Everything that surrounds it reflects the seminary's majestic countenance. And everything that's inside this quadrangle represents an evolution of a deep intellectual and pioneering theological education, the genesis of which began at the dawn of the 20th century. Today, Hampton Sydney College still has the look and feel of its roots in 19th century rural architecture. In 1892, it was home to a professional seminary that was lacking in any modern conveniences and falling behind what the Industrial Revolution was building. At this time, Walter W. Moore, who had been the senior professor, was traveling all over the country by train and realized that Union was behind the times. He was getting frustrated if you look at his correspondence with being able to go all over the country and that takes him an hour to two hours to get from Farmville to Hampton, Sydney. So he gives this speech and he said, you know, it's getting hard to raise money. I think we ought to think about moving. Walter W. Moore gives a speech to the board in 1892 and he said, the tobacco barons of North Carolina don't want to give any more money to a failing physical plant. Are we in the right place? The students talk about cows uh, walking onto the campus, putting their heads in the windows and getting more out of the lectures than they were. They had to chop their own wood. And they were uh, accused of breaking up furniture when it was too cold for to use as firewood. There was no central eating facility. They had to either cook their own in the room, which was illegal, or against the rules, I should say, or go to one of the little uh, refectories that were privately run around the campus. Dr. Moore turned to Louis Ginter, a tobacco manufacturer, real estate developer, and philanthropist, whose outsized influence has given Richmond's North Side its unique and stately character. Moore readily accepted the offer, and the new development of Ginter Park was on the precipice of monumental change. Dr. Moore hired architect Charles H. Reed, Jr., the son of a prominent local Presbyterian pastor and a graduate at the University of Virginia. Walter Moore believed that having all the buildings surround a grassy plain would create a spiritual energy that enticed students to dig into their work and at the same time build a community among themselves. The plans called for five buildings to make up the perimeter of the quad. Three were constructed simultaneously, the library, Westminster Hall, and Watts, the centerpiece of the complex. In 1898, the new buildings began to come into focus on a once barren landscape, creating Richmond's newest and one of its most striking landmarks. In the September 1898 issue of Union Seminary Magazine, the editor gave high praise to the architectural style of the stately Watts Hall. It impresses one with its durability and immovability, giving the prospect of long residence in the land. This would prove to be a prophetic statement. Two years later, the consensus was reached that the new building needed a proper chapel, 
along came George W. Watts of Durham, North Carolina. He funded the $15,000 it cost to construct this circular chapel that was annexed onto the original building. The upper portions of Watts were used to house incoming students, and many marveled at the fact that this brand new building was heated by steam and lit by gas. Westminster Hall was designed to be the main housing for the students, and while it was 80 miles away from the Hampton-Sydney campus, it truly was light years ahead of anything these students had seen. Westminster Hall was built and it was a wonder. It had wrought iron all over the place. In fact, it was one of the last buildings in Richmond built that used so much wrought iron. It had indoor plumbing, and that was amazing to the students. There's a funny story that a student was returning to Richmond for the opening of the seminary. He had been in Hampton, Sydney, and he stopped off at the Lexington Hotel and spent a dollar for uh, a bath and a shave, and then took the trolley here and was upset to find out that there was already <laughs> bathtubs here the students could use, and uh, well, with drains and running water and everything, and there were signs up until the 1920s reminding students not to stand in the tub while they turned the lights on and off. Also, up until the 1930s, there were rules about cuspidors in the rooms for students chewing tobacco. Directly across the quad from Westminster, the Latch Building had inside of it Walter Moore's key vision of a modern and influential seminary, the Spence Library. Moore had been planning a library like this for more than a decade. With funding from W.W. W. Spence, an elder in the First Presbyterian Church in Baltimore, the library quickly became the envy of any theological building in America. It began with 16,000 volumes. By 1922, the library's volumes nearly doubled and boasted some of the first of a new game-changing technology, typewriters. This kept in with Moore's desire to be on a continuous course to modernity in education. Prospective students quickly noticed. Amazing. You have the three buildings, you have along that side and that side faculty housing, and within two years, enrollment almost doubles. Richmond Hall is the next building that is constructed, and that has the refectory on the bottom floor. The upper floor is student housing because they're just getting so many students who want to come here. Modern facilities, it's easy to get to. And Moore was a nationally renowned scholar. He was a leader in theological education. And this whole quad becomes probably the most modern seminary in the country. And students are flocking to it. Still, there was an incomplete end on the quad, and it would take until 1925 to close it, making a proper quad. Really, a Schaffler Hall, the present library, is the last building built. And that is a uh, result of more realizing that there has to be more practical education. And Schaffler was actually a northerner. He was uh, in charge of Sunday schools in New York City. Moore liked his ideas and had Schaffler Hall constructed to emphasize education. They had to knock down some faculty houses to do that. Then, Ginner Park Presbyterian Church, which had been meeting here in Watts Hall, moves to Schaffler Hall and becomes a demonstration church. Very practical, very open to the community. And that is really the last building that is built. The plan, however, was not to end there. Dr. Moore was nothing if not ambitious. He worked to raise money to expand the seminary that would more than double its size. These plans show that fundraising efforts had massive expansion in mind. Unfortunately, economic obstacles kept getting in the way. The first was the Great Depression in 1929. Their vision of the campus was to keep what's here and then move over to the Westwood Tract with the huge libraries, more student housing, and it was all going to be in the Gothic style. 
Then there was the mid-century campaign in 1949 and post-war inflation doomed that. And then there was the advance campaign in the late 60s and inflation kind of destroyed that. Despite those setbacks, the seminary as it was remained vibrant and vital from the depression forward. It was seen as a success because the faculty felt that students were graduating with more training and the right kind of training. Testament to the sustained quality of both the architecture and construction of these four buildings is evident in how they all look today. The only changes over the decades were simply reflections of each era of its existence. When the quad was first built, it was, you could take your horse and buggy uh, on the walkway now, and there was, in the original plans, a stable and a laundry set to be set in the middle of the quad. When cars came along up, and up through the 1940s, you could drive your car around the inside of the quad. It was a gravel road. One of the hallmarks of the Spence Library was the constant effort by Walter Moore to keep it modern with the best technology available at the time. Walter W. Moore built Union's reputation through Union Seminary magazine. He took advantage of rural free mail. The seminary had mailings long before other southern seminaries. They had books that pastors could order, they had continuing education by mail, all this before World War I, is, it's amazing. And so technology and the library always went together. John Trotty always tried to keep the library up to date. His frustration in my conversations with him is he realized that the technology that was coming online, you just couldn't fit any more wires in the library. Fire hazard, lack of electricity. It's not well known that the library was actually condemned because the amount of books were too heavy for the floors. At the end of the 1930s, Henry Brim said we needed a new library. Went and got an architect. And then December 7th, 1941 happens. Yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. Well, he had already raised the money and the addition to Spence Library actually took place during World War II. And it really was a miracle it was completed because all the steel was requisitioned for the war effort. But they got the steel and it was built. Inside the milieu of these buildings, a seismic cultural change began to emerge and spread throughout the Presbyterian Church, one that created divides throughout the country and the church itself. The seminary firmly believes that the Bible is the unique witness to Christ. It also recognizes that a minister must relate biblical principles to modern secular human problems. I think the very fact that the seminary moves from a, what I would say almost hermetically sealed community in Southside Virginia to a city was like steam from a pressure cooker. The students get here and they see all kinds of fields for evangelism. And I would say the movement here is a perfect example of the law of unintended consequences. One of the first things that happens is students go out to working people and to the black population and they start to evangelize. And there's a huge movement on campus to start a black church. And all of these efforts are in direct opposition to the stated policies of the PCUS, the Southern Presbyterian Church. So what happens, you have students come from all over the South and there's a sizable amount of Northern students. They are in a society which is segregated by law, yet they are evangelizing minority communities. 
because they feel called to do it. Both students at ATS and then PSCE were involved in this, and this is not something that anybody ever envisioned. The culture at the seminary ultimately helped transform the Presbyterian Church into a community that is unafraid to tackle intellectual investigation of the faith. Students ask probing questions, where under guidance they search their own minds for understanding and appropriation of the truths of the Christian heritage. And a community of people who feel their time here informed the best of their lives moving forward. When I first showed up in the summer of 1981 for Baby Greek School, I became a resident of Westminster Dorm on the first floor. I met some of the best friends I've ever made in my life, and we're still friends to this day. After eight decades of growing and transforming in Richmond, the seminary was literally bursting at the seams, especially the library. Along about the 1980s. There was a feeling that if we were going to be a graduate institution that we had to have a library that could handle not only the demands of graduate education. We also had the Regner Recording Library. There was all kinds of new technology coming up. And the seminary looked at Schaffler Hall and said, you know, we need a new library. This is the place. If Schaffler Hall was indeed the place, that meant the future of Union Theological Seminary had to be decided right then and there. There is a movement among the faculty to start to approve designs, and the question is asked at the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, if we spend all this money on the library, this means that the seminary is going to stay in Richmond. Schaffler Hall was gutted and doubled in size, with the one-time exterior brick wall now providing support to a magnificent atrium that is at once breathtaking and yet perfectly conducive to study. And the materials used for that research are seemingly endless in a library that holds the knowledge of centuries of scholarship. All of this coincided with the controversial union of UTS and the Presbyterian School of Christian Education. As part of the combining of these two institutions and curriculums, Spence Library was renovated into the Allen and Jeanette Early Center for Christian Education and Worship. Brick-exposed classrooms preserve the best of the Spencer Library's original architecture while creating class spaces that welcome open discussion and deep learning across a great many subjects. Perhaps the most striking transformation came in the early center's new chapel, a tribute to both modernity and deep faith in a place for quiet worship and joyful gathering of students and faculty. Wow, yeah, it's just like I remember that. It is. Today, as generations of alum come back for seminars, visits, and capital campaigns, they readily acknowledge that the time they spent in the confines of the Quad was of the utmost importance in their professional, intellectual, and spiritual lives. You sit here and read, it was wonderful. I graduated in 2010. It was a great pleasure and a challenge to be here as a student. When I lived here uh, as a student, way back when, I thought of Watts Hall over there as the center of my little Presbyterian universe, and I got to live next door to it. Seminary was a great experience after uh, high school and then four years of higher education. It's really with seminary where I learned to think critically, and so I, I treasure my time here at Union. That's why Union Presbyterian Seminary is on a continuous path of renovation and renewal. Westminster will soon serve as the headquarters for the Leadership Institute. Watts will undergo its most significant transformation since the chapel was added in the early 20th century. And there's so much more that must be done to preserve and fuel the pioneering academic achievement that happens within this quadrangle every day. When people come here, they want the latest, they want technology they're used to, and if the seminary doesn't have it, they'll pass it by.
Certainly this campus has been everything Walter Moore hoped it would be, and most likely, far more. I think that no matter what happens, Union Seminary is gonna be here. When I was writing my book, I would walk around the quad, and I would think about how much things have changed and how much things have remained the same. When I walk around, what I see efforts to preserve the tradition. I take confidence in that.